Hey friends, this is Ashley with Uncommon Roots Homestead and today I am doing a couple of things. So it's late, it's about 8.30 in the evening. I uh, clearly have had a long day. Um, I had a long day at work and then spent some time with the kids and they're finally asleep and Kevin is upstairs working out and so I am gonna tackle this. But I also wanna talk about something really fun. Just a second. Okay, so I showed you what I'm dealing with. I'll set you up so you can see better in just a minute. Um, I clearly have a lot here. Uh, I have all of my seeds. This is not, I do not recommend this as your organizational method. Um, this does not work. I cannot, I cannot tell you how many times every year I sort my seeds, I get them all organized, I write down my list of everything I wanna do, and then I put them all into this bag, and inevitably, it rolls around that it's time to start seeds, and out of sight, out of mind. If I can't see the seeds I need to start, I don't start them. So this year, thanks to my good friend Jill over at Whispering Willow Farm, I'll actually link her video below, um, but she did a video on seed organization that I thought was wonderful, um, she is a photo organizer. Um, one of these fine doohickeys. Um, uh, it holds four by seven photos, which happen to be the perfect size for seeds. And this one has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This one has 16 um, individual like cases inside this bigger case. Um, and I think it's gonna be perfect. It's gonna allow me to uh, plant both by variety and also um, or organized both by variety and also by plant date, um, like plant seed starting date. Um, and then it's also mobile, so I can carry it out to the garden if I'm going to be direct sowing, or I can carry like one individual section out um, so that I don't deal with seed packets left in the rain um, or just totally forgotten. So I am really excited. I'm going to be organizing my seeds, or at least starting today. I also bought a handy dandy label maker. Pretty excited about this little guy. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna be doing that today, but that is not what I wanna tell you about because I think that a lot of people have covered um, seed organization videos and I think there's just a lot of really good information out there already. And honestly, I'm not doing anything super innovative. The only thing that I'm gonna do different um, is I'm going to categorize, like I said, both by variety and by um, sow date. So I want to be able to easily just grab one or two sections at each kind of interval that I need to start seeds um, because not everything starts at the same time. So if you're new to gardening, um, that's a good piece of information to know. Some seeds take different amounts of time to germinate. Um, they grow slower. They take more time to be strong enough to go out in the garden. So you really need to know when each variety um, and generally speaking, it's each like species. Um, so if you're doing like melons or um, brassicas or whatever, like each of those like general varieties and then the varieties within those, um, usually they're gonna be pretty similar. So like if you're doing brassicas, usually you can start your cauliflower and your kale at the same time inside. Um, there'll be some one-offs, like you'll have early varieties or late varieties um, and things like that to be aware of. But I'm gonna go ahead and organize all of that so that you know, um, middle of January, I have some seeds I'm gonna start today. Those will be together so that I know, oh, okay, January 15th, I need to grab that. I need to start these seeds because it's gonna be time to put them in the garden. By time, if I start them now, they'll be old enough to go in the garden um, by time the last frost is passed. So today, that's exactly what I'm gonna talk about. What can you grow in zone seven in the middle of January? Um, there is something you can grow. In fact, there are a lot of things that you can grow, um, especially if you have a 
greenhouse or something like that, then your options are really endless. I'm not talking about that today. If you don't have a greenhouse, don't worry. That's not what I'm talking about. Um, I, or at least not what I'm going to focus on. Obviously I'm probably gonna talk about it, but today I am starting a few things that I'm really excited about and have never successfully grown. Lavender. So lavender is tricky. It's one of the hardest things to start from seed. Um, and I think, so I've tried lavender three years now. This is my third year. And I've never successfully grown it. But I'm doing it different this year. So lavender is tricky. Um, it can take up to 90 days just to germinate. Um, and it's very peculiar about, or particular, it's, I guess it's peculiar too, but it's particular. It's very particular about temperature um, and moisture levels. So I think that the reason I have not successfully been able to grow lavender in the past um, has been that I was not patient enough. Um, 90 days is a long time, that's three months. That means that if I start now in the middle of January, that's February, March, April. Um, that's a long time to tend to seeds if you cannot see them growing. I think that that's been my problem. When I think back to previous years, I don't think I've ever given lavender seeds more than 30 days to sprout. And that's what germination is. That's that first sprouting. So I am going to be patient this year. And then the other thing that I did is I bought multiple varieties. So I have common English lavender. I have Moonstead Lavender. I have two varieties of Vera Lavender. Um, actually, three. I have three varieties of Vera Lavender. So I have three different varieties of lavender that I'm going to be growing. All three of these are perennial in my zone, which means I only have to successfully do this once. If you remember back to my garden plan, um, which actually, let me show you. Okay, I went to grab my garden plan and found more seeds and also a garden planner that I'm gonna tell you about. But see, this is why you need seed organization. I have seeds all over this house. I am probably still have seeds all over this house. But my goal is to start to get organized so that moving forward when I find random packets of seeds that have come in the mail and were dropped in our mail carrier, um, when I find them, I can throw them where they belong moving forward. So anyways, um, I went ahead and grabbed my garden plan. So if you remember, um, I have a whole section here for lavender. This section is about, um, that's about 25 feet by four or five feet. So what I'm thinking is that that's gonna be about uh, four or five feet. I'll probably do two rows. So two 25 foot rows of lavender. Each lavender plant really should be about two, a foot and a half, two feet apart. Um, so that's what I have 50 feet. They need to be about two feet apart. So I'm going to need about 25 lavender plants, give or take. Um, and I also, I'm going to start probably more than 25, uh, because I want to kind of buffer it. So if they don't sprout, um, but then if I end up with more healthy plants by time May rolls around and it's time to put them in the garden, I'm just going to put that lavender in other places, or I'll expand that growing area a little bit. I have the luxury, um, on the land of if, as you move this way, I have a lot of space. So our orchard starts like there's a tree right here. Um, then the other row starts about right here. So it'll kind of like cap in those potatoes, but then they go down. So over on this side, I actually don't have anything. It's a hill. So it drops off somewhere around right here and starts to slope downward. Um, but actually lavender would be fine in that. It grows really well on hillsides. So um, I could even do lavender down into the front of the property. So those are um, why uh, or how I'm gonna start my lavender and, and why I think it'll be successful this year. The other thing that you can start right now in zone seven um, is anything really anything that is going to take a long time to germinate. Um, there are a couple of different ornamentals and flowers that take a long time to germ germinate that if you want them in your garden, um, you should go ahead and start them now. I am actually going to be starting silver dollar eucalyptus. Eucalyptus is uh, only, um, it's only a perennial and like 
hardy down to zone eight. So we're in zone seven, which is obviously gonna get too cold. So a reminder, the zones, the US uh, zones, they are, USDO zones are, USDA zones are based on how cold it gets in your area. Um, so it's a little bit confusing, right? I'm in zone seven. You might also be in zone seven. Um, I'm in Tennessee. You might be in Maryland. My last frost date might be in the end of April. Yours might be in the beginning of May or mid-May or late May. Um, that has nothing to do with it. For the longest time, I thought, oh, if I find another gardener in zone seven, I can just follow exactly what they do. I can start my seeds when they start their seeds and I can do all these things, but that's actually not accurate. Um, you really should go by your specific zip code if you're in the US, um, your specific zip code and the first and last frost dates in your zip code. Um, that can even vary by like geographical area within a city. So we're in East Tennessee. If we went like three cities over, we went to mid Tennessee or West Tennessee, um, even though we might be in the same zone, our frost dates are gonna be different. So make sure that you're paying attention to your final spring frost and then your first fall frost in your specific area of the country, regardless of your zone. Um, but if your first spring or your last spring frost is somewhere around mid to late April, like it is for me, um, then this is a good time to start things like lavender or eucalyptus that are gonna take longer. So with eucalyptus, because it's a perennial, but not perennial in my zone, um, instead of just letting it grow and die, which I think would be really sad, I'm actually gonna grow this and I'm going to plant it in um, half whiskey barrels. So eucalyptus kind of grows like a tree, which I never knew that, in fact, I buy eucalyptus all the time and never really thought about growing it. For some reason, it seems like something that is so outside of my ability to grow. Um, maybe because it's so, I don't know, it's just very like ornamental and it almost seems tropical and obviously it kind of is tropical. It grows, it grows uh, perennial as a perennial in zones eight through 11. Um, but it actually grows really well in containers. So I'm going to start eucalyptus today. Uh, I have 30 seeds here. Um, and I am going to try to transplant these into a container and see if we can let them grow. Um, eucalyptus trees actually grow really tall and kind of like bushy. So I'm excited about that. So today I'm going to start the lavender and the eucalyptus. Um, the other things that you could start right now, if you're in a similar zone to me or have a similar first, um, or last frost, date uh, are any types of lettuce. They are cold hardy. Um, if you do have a greenhouse, you can do that. But if you don't have a greenhouse, you could actually do lettuce in a container, um, like a Rubbermaid container with soil at the bottom, couple holes for, for air, and that'll keep it warm enough for that to actually grow. So you could start some lettuce right now. I'm actually going to start a little bit of lettuce today as well. Um, and yeah, that that's what you can do right now. I know that it's hard, right? When we get to the middle of January and the holidays are past and sometimes if you're in a mild climate, there are days every now and then that kind of feel like spring. We just had like a 50 degree day um, a couple of days ago. Like, so it's not, it's not even freezing all the time here and it can get really difficult to wait and to be patient, but good things come to those who wait. And you will be so sad if you take that one spring-like day and you decide to start all of your tomatoes or your peppers because in six to eight weeks, those tomatoes and peppers are gonna wanna live outside. And unfortunately, if you're not in a warmer zone, they're not gonna live and you're not gonna be able to sustain them inside unless you have really great infrastructure like large grow lights and you keep up potting them, um, they're not gonna be able to live in a little container for three or four months. So be patient, be patient, be patient. Um, we are close to the time that in this zone with uh, April, late April, um, last frost that you can start brassicas. Uh, and that kind of brings me to a garden planner. So there's a lot of information, right? There's a lot of information on the internet. There's a lot of information on YouTube um, and it's difficult to keep track of. I really like Clyde's Garden Planner. Um, I've been using this for a couple of years now and I find that it's surprisingly um, easy to use and it also 
really helps me stay organized. Now it's not all inclusive. So the one thing that I don't love about Clyde's Planner is that it has a lot of varieties, but it doesn't have all of the varieties that I'm growing. So, I mean, it's got like tomatoes, peppers, melons, onions, potatoes, sweet corn, cabbage, cucumbers, okra, pumpkins, summer squash, carrots, cauliflower, chard, peas, peas, beets, broccoli, green beans, um, bush, radish, turnip, leaf lettuce, spinach, um, and, and that's all that it has. Um, and I guess that was the fall side. On the spring side, of course, I'm ready to do the fall side first. On the spring side, it has onions, peas, spinach, cabbage, cauliflower, radish, turnips, beets, potatoes, broccoli, lettuce, carrots, chards, green beans, bush, sweet corn, cucumbers, squash, summer, melons, peppers, tomatoes, okra, pumpkins. Um, so it's got a good list, but it obviously doesn't have any, everything. If you're looking for, you know, things that might be perennials like asparagus or um, artichokes, you're not gonna find them on there, uh, as well as some like of the, you know, more special varieties and things like that. But what it is really great for is figuring out generally when you should start your seeds. So the way that it works, um, and you can pick these up at a lot of different seed stores. I think I ordered, I threw it, but I think I ordered this one from Baker Creek. Um, when I put in another order and they were running a special, so I put in my seed order and I think I got it for 99 cents, but, um, the way that it works is you go by your um, your first, this is the fall side, I would do the first fall frost. On the spring side, I'm gonna do the average last spring frost. So I know that mine this year is April 19th, uh, I think it's actually like April 22nd. So I'm gonna put it right past the April 19th. And then this lines up when I should start seeds indoors, if I should even start them indoors, it actually identifies if you should start seeds directly outside. Um, so say I want to start, um, and then it also has like the expected harvest dates with these check marks, which is really cool. Um, so if I have, um, it's got like this SI for in indoor seeding dates. So say I want to, start some broccoli, then I know I need to actually start that by March 1st in order to have it ready to go into the ground um, after my last uh, frost, which is really great. There are some things that I feel like this is lacking a little bit. Um, it doesn't have seed starting dates for everything, which is hard if you're a new gardener, um, but generally I think it's a really great resource. So when I want to look at, so say I wanted to start my tomatoes, I'm going to look at this. I should not start my tomatoes based on my last spring frost until the end of March. So we're in January. Don't start your tomatoes. Um, but if I start them, if I'm patient and I start them in March 22nd or that week, um, then they're going to be the perfect size and ready to go out in the garden uh, right after my last anticipated uh, spring frost. So this is a really great resource if you're looking at what can you plant when. Um, but some of those things, like I said, any of the ornamentals, things that take a long time to germinate are great to start now, um, as well as any like lettuce or things like that that you can easily protect um, that are cold hardy. You could start brassicas now here in zone seven. Um, you could, but you're gonna need some kind of protection because it is getting, we're, we are in like the heart of the winter. It is as cold as it gets now. Um, and for us, that means zone seven, that means it gets to zero um, and zero Fahrenheit. And what that means is that if you have a lovely little baby kale and you go put it in the garden in one of the random days, then it might be 50 degrees when at night it drops down to 15 degrees, that poor baby kale is probably not going to survive. So you would need some kind of row cover um, or pretty good protection on that. And then you'd also probably wanna keep it inside and let it grow bigger than you would if you had done this earlier when it was still warmer or if you were planting kale for the spring. So that's kind of my best advice if you're like really eager to get your hands in the dirt. So back over to starting lavender and eucalyptus. How am I going to do that? This year, I decided to try out um, some pre-purchased organic seed starting mix. You can definitely make your own. There are a lot of great videos on that. Um, I went for convenience this year and I knew I wasn't gonna be starting everything right now. I'm just starting a couple of things, obviously. 
uh, and so it was easier for me to pick up a bag. Um, but I'm going to take this mix. You can hear it's really dry um, and it's really light right now. So what I'm actually gonna do is get this really saturated and make sure that it has time to soak in that water. I'm going to fill, um, I have my clean, make sure you clean these if you're gonna be reusing them again. I actually am reusing ones that I uh, purchased starts in in previous years. This is like my third year using these. Um, I feel like it's a shame that we just throw these away every time. So instead of buying them, I usually just use whatever I inevitably end up getting from our local nursery, but wash them really good after each use. You don't wanna be like spreading uh, different uh, sorry, I have a notice pop up there. Okay, sorry. <laughs> you don't wanna be spreading any different diseases or things like that. You wanna make sure that um, those are clean and sterilized. So one way that you can do that is rinse them out after the end of the season and leave them out in the sun for a couple of days. That'll kill everything. Or you can wash them. Um, I, I have heard other gardeners wash with like bleach and then rinse really well. Um, you just wanna make sure that you've killed anything that was in there. So I wash them in really hot water and then I let them sit um, out under a light or on, in the sun. So uh, these, I did that and then they're actually a little bit wet because I just, um, I just sprayed them all because I'm going, I got them wet before I put the seed starting mix in. I'm gonna put the seed starting mix in and then I'm going to water them on top and then I'm going to bottom water as well. So I have these great trays um, that I also got at a local nursery, but you can buy these online. Um, they do not have any holes in the bottom. So what I do is I set these starting uh, little, I don't even know what to call these right now. Anyways. I put these little starting trays into this big tray and then I'll bottom water, which means I'm watering from the side so they can soak up. The reason bottom watering is important, and you might hear that a lot. Um, it might say it on your seed packs, you might hear it you know, from different uh, videos you watch and things like that. But the reason it's so important is that seedlings are so um, fragile they are really susceptible to things like mold and injury, watering and even uneven watering. Like watering from the top is an imperfect science and it can actually cause more harm than good if they don't dry completely or if you know it's not drafty enough where you have them placed. If you water them on top and that water sits there, they can mold um, and I'm sure you've had this happen. I've had this happen where I have a couple of sprouts, one, maybe the shell, the seed shell, didn't actually come off when it sprouted and then that whole thing became moldy because when I watered it that water just kind of like sat and festered in there that's why it's really important to water from the bottom also when you water from the bottom the plants are able to kind of self-serve they're able to take all of the water that they need each individual plant instead of just like overwatering or potentially underwatering. When you water from the bottom and just make sure there's always water in the tray, those plants are gonna be happy because they can drink as much as they want or as little as they want. Um, and so I've found way better success in bottom watering than I ever had with seed starting and top watering. So if you have access to some kind of tray like this and often, if you go to a local nursery and you buy a number of starts or whatever, they will, I'm at our local nursery, they'll actually like put your order in one of these trays and then I just keep them and reuse them. This is probably my fourth year with this tray. Um, and it's pretty, it's kind of like heavier duty plastic. Um, and yeah, it's really great. It's a, you know, had I not wanted to reuse these, it would have just ended up in a landfill. So I am happy to use this year over year until I absolutely can't. And then I will either purchase a new one or I'll go and pick up another one. So um, that is how I am going to start. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and try to make some organized method out of this madness. And then I'll go ahead and start my seeds. So let's do it.
Okay, so I got everything organized. I still have to go through and use the label maker and put the um, sew dates and varieties on each of those containers, but just about everything fit. So that whole mess that was in multiple containers is now in there. I had some like larger packages of seeds where I had kind of bought in bulk um, just because it was cheaper and it was what I had available to me. And so those I still have just in a gallon freezer bag, um, but I'll use those up. And then um, I don't usually buy that large of quantity of things that I'm only gonna plant one or two of. So uh, moving forward, I should be able to put those into the container. But I mean, even if you needed like two or three of those, that is such a great way to store your seeds. I don't know why. It took me so long. Um, I had this really cute thing for a while that worked and I might keep like the extras in there, but um, it's just too small. It's so cute, but way too small. So now I'm gonna get over to planting that lavender. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I wanted to show you something real quick. So do you see how dry this is? If I, you probably could see it in the video, but um, it's like super dusty and dry. And as soon as they poured it in, there was just dust everywhere. Do not plant your seeds in that. Um, if I planted the seeds right now, before I rehydrated this soil, um, I would run into a lot of issues. Um, not only would the act of rehydrating the soil probably displace the seeds, so cause them to either flow up to the top where they're not gonna germinate or go too deep where they're not gonna germinate or have enough, um, you know, the mobility to actually break above the soil. Um, they would risk just being killed in the process of rehydrating the soil. So do not ever plant in super dry soil. And that goes for outside too. If you're direct sowing and your soil is super dry, don't plant in that soil. Make sure you rehydrate the soil, add water, add life back to your soil before you plant. So what I'm gonna do right now is rehydrate this. Um, and it might actually take longer than, you know, it's not just throwing some water on it and then planting. I wanna make sure that the, the soil is actually saturated um, and that it's retaining the water and not just running through. So I'm going to wet these from above and then I'm also gonna fill the tray um, that I showed you before down below so that these can start to suck that water in from the bottom while I also put water on top before I even think about sowing my seeds. Okay, so I am actually going to leave these overnight and let them soak up more water. Um, they're just super, super dry right now. So you can kind of see what it looks like right now. Um, I, You watched, I wet this a ton of times and you can see how I, as I dig in, it's still really dry. Um, and so what I did is I just wet it one more time with some nice warm water. Um, and then I filled the bottom of this basin with water. And so overnight, what this will do is actually soak that water up from the bottom and I've watered it from the top. So hopefully by the morning, this is nice and moist all the way through and I'll be ready to plant my seeds. So that's what we're gonna do. All right, hello. So it is a few days later. Um, I realized as I went back through and was kind of looking at the footage that I had, I never posted this video. Um, after I finished recording it, sometimes you just have videos that you are like, mm, I don't think so. You know, I, I don't know if that was everything I wanted it to be at the time. And I went back through and I rewatched the footage. And you know what, I think that there is value in me posting this video um, because I talked about a couple of really important things like rehydrating your soil, um, kind of the varieties that you can start planting right now. Even though that was a couple weeks ago, you can still start those varieties today. Um, and ultimately I think that it's still, there's still some good content in there. So I wanted to kind of fill in the gaps because what happened after I rehydrated the soil? Well, the next day I went ahead and I planted lavender. So there are a couple of methods that you can use when you're planting lavender. 
You can just plant the lavender like you do any other seed, and that's fine. That works most of the time. You'll have um, decent germination, but you really have to have like the perfect environment for those seeds. So really moist soil, a little bit of humidity, um, the perfect amount of topsoil, like it just has to be perfect. The second way that you can plant lavender is through cold stratification. So cold stratification basically is replicating the outdoor environment of lavender seed that would go to seed and regrow, which means we're, you know, lavender grows in colder zones. So that seed would freeze and then it would defrost into moist soil and then sprout. So cold stratification indoors, like for a home gardener, what that looks like is either putting your seeds in the fridge or the freezer. There are a couple of different methods that you can use, um, basically chilling those seeds and then planting them to kind of replicate that seasonal change that the seeds would go through in nature. I wanted to try this year not doing that. I've tried lavender before without really any special attention, just starting it with other seeds and it never worked, but I thought maybe, and I talked about this in the other video, maybe I wasn't patient enough. You know, there are a lot of other like moving pieces. So I figured, you know, I wanted to give it one last go. Um, to see if it would grow without using cold stratification. There's no reason not to do that, right? Um, and if these seeds that I've planted don't germinate, the next round that I do, I am going to use cold stratification. So I'll make a video on that if I end up doing that as well. But the next day I planted those seeds. So the general rule of thumb when you're planting seeds is that you wanna take the, um, the length of the seed and plant it that deep. So, uh, Lavender seeds are super tiny. They're almost, they're like the size of carrot seeds. Um, and so basically what I did, I just dropped two or three into each cell and then I took my soil and like sprinkled it on top. So just a very light covering. Um, and I did that almost exactly two weeks ago today. And I wanna show you what is happening and I'll show you kind of the final setup that I ended up with. So let's take a look. All right, so this is what the soil looks like. It's been rehydrated, those seeds are planted. Um, and you'll notice I'm not seeing anything here, nothing there, nothing there, nothing. What is that? See, we have a sprout. So at least one sprout. I'm not seeing any others quite yet, but this is still early. Lavender can take up to 30 days um, or longer. It can take up to three months, um, I was reading in some places. So we're only two weeks in. I am not giving up on these. I'm going to start another batch of these in the next couple of days. Um, but you can see, you can kind of even see the seeds in a couple of places where it's just really lightly planted. But I'm very excited. I've actually never gotten this far. I've never had any type of germination. Um, on a lavender seed. So that little sprout is very exciting. So that's where we are today. Uh, I am gonna be starting a lot more seeds here in the next couple of days. I just ordered in a couple more seed starting tools. Um, so I'm gonna make another video uh, probably tomorrow actually and kind of walk through what I ordered, what I'm using for seed starting, and then how I'm also gonna be starting seeds that we're gonna sell at the farmer's market. So stay tuned, join us again tomorrow. And thanks for joining us today. We appreciate you. If you're not already, find us on Instagram over at Uncommon Roots Homestead. Have a great night.